thanks be to our God. What a, a beautiful time of worship and just praise and thanksgiving. We're, we're grateful, oh God, that we can call upon you. So we're, we're ready for, I think maybe in this iteration anyway, our final installment of the Tabernacle series. Um, so, Rochelle, we're waiting, ready, and energized to hear what the Lord would speak through you and to us. Amen. Amen. Trust so to him, to him be the glory. Thomas, I love your choice of songs. The names of our God thrill me. And I've been in a study of a couple of those names, one in particular during this past week, and it's just been very enriching, and it just was beautiful to hear it, and I think very fitting, because our tabernacle is a building, but it is a picture of our God also. And uh, another way that it, it's his name, because we know Yeshua tabernacled among us, and we know that we will have that uh, glory coming also. This is the... the um, crescendo of our study. It has been a wonderful study, a very rich study, and I trust a blessing to you as much as it has been to me. Um, what we are doing tonight is an overview of lessons five through eight. If you remember, we did lessons one through four, and then we stopped and took that step back and looked at the whole picture. Then we moved forward with five through eight. Five started us into the holy building and we went through eight last week, so I'm going to be bringing out just highlights, which means we won't stop as long on each piece of the furniture. We won't go into as much detail. I trust that you uh, basically will remember, but if there's anything you don't, the videos are there for you to go back and to look at. But uh, I left out a really important part last week. I couldn't believe it. At least I don't think in my recall that I brought it in. So I'm excited to bring you a real nugget from Lesson 8. And then uh, the Lord directed me into a way to really bring this home for each one of us that I am excited to share uh, something new that he's teaching me that I will share with you when we come to the end. So I trust it's going to be a real blessing to you. Uh, are we ready? Do I take it? Or? I'll go ahead and share it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Roger's getting in the, the PowerPoint up. There we are. So if you can just give me thumbs up, if you can see the PowerPoint, everything looks good. I see one thumb up. I see two. Okay, good. <laughs> Anyone in trouble? Thumb down. <laughs> All right, now the ones who I can see a picture of, it looks like we are good. Okay, so again, remember this is just an overview, so we won't go into as much detail, but we're going to be stepping into that tabernacle building that you're looking at right now. It was made up of two rooms, the holy place and the holy of holies or the most holy place. That second part, the back part, the 15 by 15 by 15, is where God's presence dwelt. I'll remind you that it was made out of wood. The boards were acacia wood covered in gold. Gold reminding us of the deity, but the wood and being the humble wood, the lowly wood of the acacia tree reminded us of the humility. So we saw the deity of Yeshua and at the same time his humility or his humanity. The building itself was lifted above the earth, though. It's at, on um, sockets that brought it up above. And we know that Yeshua was cut off from the earth when he suffered death on the cross for us. We also saw that the cornerstone of this building was holding the whole building together. It was causing it to grow together, so to speak. And it reminded us that we are on the cornerstone today, the cornerstone of the tabernacle of our Most High God, the cornerstone we know from Pesach, Passover time, being the most important, the, the one that was set into the building and then the whole building rested on it. So it's a picture of us growing together in unity to be one with the Lord and to realize that, that it, it, wherever the Lord's presence is, is a spiritual dwelling place for us. So when we mention now that we have the Spirit within us, and we will talk heavily about that next week when we celebrate Shavuot, we can realize that this is how we're referring to the, the spiritual. It's coming right into the very presence of our Most High God, 
as it was when they would enter, I shouldn't say they, it was only the, the chief high priest who would enter the Holy of Holies once a year. Uh, the side of the building you cannot see in this picture, but we saw it before, so you can go back to previous lesson if you missed it to see. But there are five bars under what you're seeing is like a brown covering right now. The five bars ran across the building, holding it all together. Five reminds us of the number of grace, and the middle bar could not be seen. It passed through the center in an unseen way, but was really the glue that held it all together, so to speak. And that's a picture of our Ruch HaKodesh, our Holy Spirit, whom we do not see, but he is the center and the, the glue that holds it all together. We're going to go through that door in just a, a short moment. We have seen that there are, well, this is our second entrance. At this point, there are three entrances into the tabernacle. The first was into the courtyard, the second into the holy place, and the third will be into the most holy place. The one into the courtyard we saw reflected to Yeshua saying in Yochanan John, chapter 14 and verse 6, that I am the way. We have to enter into the courtyard to come to the way, to come to the presence of our God, and we immediately came to the brazen altar, which was the foot of the cross, and the way into the presence of God is through the cross. We have moved up through the cross, and we get all the way to the most holy place. We are at the top of the cross. But as I said now, the, the courtyard entrance, that gate was I am the way. The, the curtain that we will enter in a moment at the holy place is represented by I am the truth. And we know that we, uh, um, well, let me, okay, Yeshua said he was the truth. And we also know that when we came into this area, into the holy place, that we saw that there was witness and the testimony, the testimony of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established, and we saw in the truth, we have this testimony, and it was witnessed to us, and that reminds us not only of Yohanan, John 14, 6, but also in chapter 4, and verse 24, that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we come into the presence of our God through the way, through the cross, we come into the truth, and we'll finish off in just a little bit with the rest of that verse. Only the priest could enter into the holy place, and only the high priest entered into the most holy place. Does that leave us out? Do we have to stop and stay outside this curtain and not have the privilege of what is inside, seeing, learning, knowing, and having that be a part of us also? No. Thank God today we have, through Yeshua, through that cross ability, to be called by God a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, for God to possess, that we're a chosen people. He gave these words to Israel when he called Israel to be his people, and they were to be the priests to the rest of the world, to represent God to the world. And now those of us who have come into saving faith through that cross, through Yeshua, are also given that title, that we are priests unto our God, that he has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light, and we see reflected in Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, that there was a group that sang a new song. The people who could sing that new song were those who were purchased by his blood. And in that time when it was seen, and it's prophetically looking forward, but it's proleptic in the fact that it declares it as if it has already happened, we see that, that purchased by his blood were people from not just the Jewish tribes, but now from every tribe, every kindred, every time over the face of the earth. And that we know that before he returns in second coming, the gospel will have gone to the ends of the earth to reap a harvest of those souls who are coming in through the Ruch HaKodesh, through that, that cross, and, and then uh, believing in the cross, having the Ruch HaKodesh come in to seal us in our salvation, to make us part of that one building. And why has he done it? for us to proclaim the truth, his truth, not speaking for ourselves, but we are speaking for him. Just as he came and said he came to do the will of his father, he came to complete what his father gave him to do, and he came to say what his father wanted him to say, we reflect what Yeshua was representing also. The curtain, just before we go in, reminding you, it's blue for the heavenly reminder, purple for the royalty that our God is, king, Scarlet colored because he gave his life sacrificially. 
There's gold in that entrance curtain, reminding again of his deity. There's even a bit of white. White reminds us of the righteous robes that he clothes us in when we become his. This curtain is held up by five pillars. I think you can see it in that one. I'll show you a closer picture in a few moments. But five is a number of grace. By God's grace, we're allowed to enter in into his presence. And the very top of it was topped with gold, reminding us our Yeshua is crowned with glory and honor. As we go uh, just one step, well, before we go one step closer, let, rem let me remind you of the outer where it looked just brown in the last picture. Remember, we had four coverings. The first covering you see, you look toward the back of the picture, is a badger covering. That took the heat in the storm of the desert. It would uh, seal off so that no uh, rain would come in and ruin the, the furniture that was inside. But there was no beauty in the badger skin. That's a picture of our Lord's humiliation, that he left his glory of, of the uh, preeminence of God. He left the glory of heaven and came down shrouded in human skin that did not contain what Moshe saw when he saw what was left behind after God passed by. We look at the next covering, and it's the ram skin dyed red. Again, red reminding us of sacrifice, but this also being the ram skin was, uh, the ram was a picture of vigor, of strength, and that shows us the Lord's consecration unto death. It took strength to come to die. And we see also that this was another excellent covering from the elements of life, that it would not allow there to be harm come to this building. The goat's hair usually is black. Here it looks white in our picture. Remember, we just have artist renditions, and we'll find a few varieties as we go along the way. But goat's hair was a great insulator from the heat and also from the cold, keeping out the cold and rain, keeping out the heat in the summer. And then it was made of a linen material that you see that in the front. Fine linen material. Again, we see all the colors. It's, uh, the linen was to remind us of the righteousness of our God. And on that curtain, not seen by anyone but the one who was inside and could look up, was embroidered carving the cherubim. And remember, the cherubim protected or guarded or vindicated God's holiness. It's his place of protection. When we hear the psalmist say that under his wings we have come to, uh, into a place of safety, that's the picture of the wings of the tree being the safe place where God's holiness dwelt. It's where his holy will is exalted. It's where his power goes forth. And we see even the power of the angels that he sends out. Because when they move his throne in heaven, when they go in his bidding, this is not your little cherub angels with peppy little cheeks and baby sweet pictures. This instead is powerful, majestic, mighty angels who are guarding that holiness of God. I'm going to take you inside now and we're going to look at the altar of incense. This was right in front of the inner curtain that we have not talked about yet. It's that third curtain. Right on the other side of that third curtain, I will cheat and tell you, in the most holy place, because I know you know, is the mercy seat. So we have the altar of incense, and the mercy seat, in essence, would be facing each other were it not for the curtain in between. The altar of incense was the highest piece of furniture in the building, and it's representative of our prayers going up to heaven. That veil that was hiding God's presence was there at a time that when the high priest would go in, he would take from this altar of incense, the smoke that was going up, would, he would take in around that veil to the inside, to the mercy seat, and in essence put up a smoke screen so that that glory presence of God would not blind the high priest. But we see that these two pieces of furniture were meant to be interacting in the sense that it's through our prayers that we come into that mercy seat. In our prayers, we are um, repentant, and we cry out for the mercy that he is freely giving to us in that mercy seat. In that sense, the altar also spoke to us of the perfect and sacrificial life of our uh, Savior, our Messiah, who is also at this point our intercessor, standing in there interceding for us day and night. Just as the high priest interceded when uh, he represented the people to God, we have the great 
Kohen Gadol, the greatest high priest, who is for, um, until we are home with them, interceding continually for us. Prayer was to be perpetual without ceasing, and the fire for it was lit by the brazen altar that reminded us of the sacrifice that was made for us to have this relationship through prayer with our God. So it would bring us into a point of praise, and there was to be nothing else burned on this altar of incense, no strange incense. In other words, it could only be our prayers. As we go on, uh, we're still inside in that first room, and we're going to come to the next piece of furniture that we're looking at in there. In a moment, I'll show you the, the pieces in relation to each other, but this was our table of showbread. It spoke of fellowship and communion. The priests ate the bread. They would eat it a week later. It was kept fresh. It was kept warm. When we think about the priests eating the bread, the, and we now, when we eat the bread, what we're doing is we're meditating on the one who is called the bread of life. We get that from Yochanan, John chapter 6, that he is the bread of life, the bread that's come down from heaven, the man or the mana, as you would say. This is also called the bread of the face or the presence of bread because God's people are ever in his remembrance. He's always presently remembering us. If it were made without leaven, then it would be a picture of Messiah's holy life, sinless life. When it was baked, it would be a picture of his suffering the crucifixion for us. Most likely, though, it was the, the um, that was without leaven. Did I say that correctly? Most likely, though, this was leavened bread, and if it was, then it would be a picture again um, rep 12 to represent the 12 tribes and that they daily needed to eat uh, from the bread that satisfies. And that, again, would be the one who is called the bread of life for us. In this same room is the candle stand. We looked at the candle stand and saw it's made out of pure gold. Very, very expensive today, and they have one made ready to go in the temple when the temple is rebuilt. Uh, but it had to be made specifically. It was the only light in the entire uh, building. There would be one shaft, and it would feed off the six, or the six branches would feed off of that one branch. So if you look at the middle of this one, the middle branch, you will see the others branch off out of it. In essence, that middle one is feeding all of the others. It was made out of beaten gold, B-E-A-T-E-N, reminding us, of, again, of the crucifixion where he was beaten for us, took stripes for our healing. Yet it also has little buds that you're seeing, and that's representative of the almond uh, branches that would bud. Almonds were a picture of resurrection life because it was the first to blossom in the springtime. It was a picture of beauty, and we see the beauty that comes out of the ashes. We see the glory that comes out of the crucifixion in being that resurrected life that the Lord in his resurrection was the first fruits, the first raised from the dead in that abundant living that we can now have ourselves. Uh, it's a picture of, of Yeshua then obviously being the light to the world. The oil that feeds it again comes from the middle branch and flows out. Picture of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and that it's his oil that gives, reveals the light of the candle stand. The Holy Spirit came not to glorify himself, but he came to glorify Yeshua, who is the eternal light of the world. As we look now at that inner veil, I believe, well, here's, I think, yes, here's a picture of the three that you can see in relation to each other. And in this room, there were priests who could help. It was what's behind the veil that only the high priest could go into. Now, in this picture, you can see the chair you beam on the curtain in the way that it was drawn there. I'm going to show you that curtain, but my next picture from another artist just doesn't show that quite in the same way. You see it in this now. Again, I'm not saying one is right. I'm not saying one is wrong. We don't know until we get home to heaven and get to see because remember, the earthly was patterned off of the heavenly. The inner veil, though, was showing us the way to God was concealed. Remember, his presence dwelt right behind that in the mercy seat, and man was separated from God's holy presence due to our sin. When the crucifixion occurred, at the point of Messiah giving up his life on that cross, suddenly this curtain 
which has no opening. The priest would go from one of the sides around the curtain to get behind it to get into the holy of holy place. Suddenly and miraculously from the very top to the bottom, this curtain was rent in two. It was torn open, showing that the way into the holy of holies was now made open. We could now go right into the holy presence of our God. Why? Because at that moment, Yeshua gave his life. He gave that sinless shed blood that we might have life because he put his blood in our place that we could be bought back, we could be atoned for, we could be redeemed and have life. That's Yochanan, John 14, verse 6 in its third part. Remember our three ways in. I am the one speaking being Yeshua. I am the way. He come, we come into the outer court. I am the truth. Through the truth of the cross, we come further in, and then he is the one who gives life, and that life is seen because we can go right into the presence of our holy God now, and our sinful life is removed, and that abundant life, seen as holy, is granted to us. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. What a beautiful picture of our Yeshua given in that one verse that really took us from the start of the tabernacle right to the crescendo, the cherry on top, the highlight, the peak, the three entrances all showing that one way into the presence of our God. And again, that curtain that was rent shows us all the colors. It shows us the cherry beam again, the, um, protecting that holiness of God. This one was held up by four pillars, and we saw that we looked at that in reference to our four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Matthew spoke to a Jewish audience and showed Yeshua as king. Mark showed him as the servant. He was the one who humbled himself as a servant, even though he was equal with God. He became as a servant to, to serve for us. Luke showed him as the son of man, gave us that humanity, and yet at the same time, capital S-O-N. Remember Yeshua 9, 6, the son was given. The son was never born, the son was given. And then Yochanan John brought it home, showing us that he is the very Son of God, very God himself. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yochanan John 1.14 tells us that Word came, dwelt among us, the Word was tabernacled among us, and it showed us the way to the Father. So that later in this book, written by Yochanan, when Philip asked, show us the Father, Yeshua said, Have I not been with you this long and you don't know? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Those who say that he never claimed to be one with Jehovah, he did claim, repeatedly claimed that. Also, these four pillars that are holding up the curtain have silver sockets at the top. Remember, silver is a picture of redemption, and that reminds us of Viagra, Leviticus 17.11, where we are told that that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and God has given it on the altar for the remission of sins, because without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. When did God put blood on the altar? The only time we know of, and the only time necessary, was when Yeshua, very God himself, put his blood on the mercy seat for us. It's Again, remember this curtain is positioned just before the ark that leads into that mercy seat, that, that place, uh, where the blood would be placed, and I believe, oh, no, nope, I'll show that to you in a little bit. I've got to show you something first, <laughs> because we're going to go behind that curtain, and we're going to look at that mercy seat, but there's several parts that we have to look at for the mercy seat, because when I call it the mercy seat, I really have to give it another name also. It really is the ark. The mercy seat literally is the lid that's sitting on the ark, and we'll show that in another picture in a moment. But the ark, which could hold things, and you see a picture in the front of several objects that were pictured as what at least at one point in time were in the ark or resting right by the ark. Ark means a place of safekeeping. That's why it looks like a chest, again, made out of acacia wood, the humanity and humbleness of our God, covered in gold, crowned. It even has a crown around it made out of gold because even though he was humbled, he has become crowned with glory. The objects being shown that were placed in the tabernacle, in the um, 
Ark, I'm sorry, were the two tablets of law, and that represented Yeshua's perfect life. He is the only one who kept the entire law. Remember, if you broke even one commandment, you were guilty of it all. But he lived a sinless, perfect life and is represented to us by God's law, which he never broke. The pot that you see is to be representative of a pot of man or the manna that uh, he, that um, Yeshua, well, that Yehovah, I'm going to say, God from heaven rained on the people for 40 years in the wilderness to feed them. They always had sufficient for the day, never could pick up enough for the next day except for Shabbat, the day they were not to do any work. If they picked up more than a day supply any other time than, than storing it for the Shabbat, it would turn wormy, it would be disgusting. What do we see? We need to feed daily on the one who gives us life, that bread of life. Also, the rod that you see is a picture of Aaron's rod that, that bedded a Haron's rod. Remember a few moments ago the candlestick that looked like the almond tree branches? That rod was an almond tree. When it was placed in the temple, along with the 12, uh, all 12 tribes had a representative. They each put a rod in there to see who God was saying was the one that was his choice to be the high priest. And at this time, uh, Moshe was the leader. Aharon being his brother, the Korah had come and said, it's too much all in the family. You're taking too much power, Moshe. And they said, okay, let's, let's leave the verdict with God, who is God's choice. Well, all the other rods were still dead. They were just dead sticks in that next morning. And Aharon said not only bedded, them, well, blossomed, but it also bedded and had almonds on it. God's choice that this was the one who was to be representative in the priestly role. We're noticing now that when I called it the mercy seat, that it was the lid of that chest. And that means, that, uh, the mercy seat means to cover or to atone. It's the place where God's mercy, which demanded justice, would be met. That's propitiation. Propitiation uh, satisfies the, the payment for the sin that had to be taken care of. God could not wink at sin. He could not ignore it. He could not say, oh, that's okay, I'll just forget it. It had to be a, a, pay, a payment price. The wages of sin was death, and it was atoned for the propitiation of our salvation met here at this mercy seat. The cherry beam were a part of that lid. It's all one piece that they were carved out of. They would come from each end. Their covering would come toward, their wings would come toward the middle, and his presence would dwell right in the middle. This next uh, picture may give you just a little bit better of a, a, an idea of that. You see the arrows pointing to the cherry beam and the mercy seat. The crown, remember, was the top of the ark. The poles, we've not talked about, but the poles enabled this to be picked up and carried because wherever they were, there was a way for atonement made for them. Wherever we come from, over the four corners of this earth, atonement is there for us all. No one anywhere on the face of this earth will be able to stand before God and say that they could not be atoned for. The way was open to all. Um, we see that... Uh, I've, I've talked about it being crowned with gold, again, the exaltation. But uh, my next picture I will show you uh, shows where the blood would have been placed. Uh, well, let's show this one first. Here's another picture that I think gives you a better <coughs> idea of the wing covering from each end that would cover. And it was believed that the presence of God dwelt right there in the middle, so to speak. And so that's why this next picture shows the blood placed on the mercy seat between the cherry beam where our sins were atoned for. The high priest would go in in his linen breeches. We'll look at those again in a little bit. It was white. He had stripped down just to the white um, undergarment that, that he wore, showing the purity that, that was necessary. But when he would come out, he would be robed again in all of the glory, and that's showing proof that that sacrifice was accepted. Our Messiah was um, stripped down, so to speak, when he hung on the cross for us. The humility was seen, but the purity was seen. And then when he came out from the grave, he came out in his glory. And when we see him, we will see him crowned with his glory. 
Now the mercy seat is the only seat in all of the tabernacle. There were no other seats. The priests never sat down. If you remember that picture before the curtain, you saw three priests that were busy working. Their work was never done. But Yeshua, being our great high priest, when he finished his work on the cross, he claimed, he cried out, more than claimed, he cried out. In Greek, the word is tetelestai, and that means it is finished. It was complete. It was done. Nothing more needed to be added. Nothing more needed to be done again. Nothing had to be repeated. It was a completed act. What God's justice demanded, Yeshua's love had now provided. Because of that, we now see our, our Yeshua seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne on high because he need do no more work. He's not a high priest that had to give the sacrifice every year. He gave once and for all. It has been done. We have the propitiation for our sins. God's holiness is fully satisfied. That's a hallelujah. It's been done for us. We don't do it. He did it fully. We just simply receive the gift he has given us. Let's look real quickly at our high priest garments in review. Oh, I, I'm going to show you a couple of my pictures. I forgot. You'll get just that overview of the whole to see once again. This shows us uh, the interacting. You can see where the smoke was going up now from the mercy seat. That's where the blood would have been applied on that one day of the year. And then the, the, you can see the altar of incense, the menorah, and the showbread. Remember, he's the light of the world. He's our bread. We come to him through prayer, and we come into that very presence. We don't need the screen of smoke. When we go into his presence, we will have been made from mortal into immortality, and we'll be able to be right into his very presence with him. Another view here, in case if something is not clear to you, just to give you uh, a little more uh, of an idea, this one, you can see the curtain in the middle that, that's been pushed back. They would never have pushed it back. The high priest would just simply go around it. It was thicker than a man's hand, by the way. That would be quite something to see torn in two. But just this Messiah's flesh was torn for us. That is what the picture was. Okay, now we'll look at the high priest's garments again very quickly. We remember that clothes are indicative of the character of the person. We can look at people's clothes today and know where they work, what kind of work they do. If you see someone in construction work, they wear a different uniform than someone who works in a restaurant. A restaurant worker will look different than someone who works behind a, a counter in a bank or other places. So the work, the clothes that, that are worn are to prote, pro, sorry, portray the character of the person, in this case, the character of Messiah. Not the high priest himself, but who he's representing. The character of Messiah, our great high priest, is being shown. When we read in Shemot, Exodus 28 and verse 2, we read that Aharon was covered with glory and beauty, wearing holy garments as set apart for serving God, expressing dignity and splendor. That reminds us how our Lord is crowned with glory and honor that he, there is a dignity about our God, there is a glory about him. And those who uh, made all of the furniture and the clothing, they were made by men described in scripture as wise-hearted, filled with wisdom, well, I'm sorry, let me be specific, filled with his wisdom and spirit. These men were not doing in their own power or energy, but by his spirit. And I encourage you, keep this in memory, that these men were called wise-hearted and filled with his wisdom and spirit. That's going to play in a little later. If you want to see that in the New Covenant, look in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18 on your own later. Now, it's hard to see here, but the tunic was the white undergarment. It was full length. The sleeves were tight. It would be bound by that sash that it calls it in the middle or the girdle. That would remind us of him being a servant because the sash would tie the girdle where they were able to work. So it was, uh, the, these pieces were reminding us that he was the servant who came to serve. But then it was covered by that blue robe. And blue reminds us of heaven. It's where he came from, where he, it's his rightful place of, um, of abode. He is ministering for us. 
but he is also now in the heaven um, interceding for us. The blue robe was one piece, one opening, it would not fray. There was a wholeness about it. There was an integrity about it. Nothing could mar or interfere with his high priestly ministering. The high priests that were uh, representative of him were not necessarily always a good representative. But with him, nothing interfered. His, the work was done perfectly. At the bottom, you see on the left, it says bells and pomegranates. Remember that the pomegranate spoke to the fruitfulness. It reminds us to, that we should be uh, producing fruit of the Spirit. It also reminds us that he presented fruit to the Father. And how is that? When he presents us. We are the fruit of his labors. Those who have come in to believe in him, we are his fruit. And for us, he is abundant, he is sweet, he is refreshing. The bells that were placed along there also were not so that they could know if something happened to the high priest behind the curtain. No. They were to sound forth the word of God. Remember, the high priest was to represent God. Sound out his word. Testify of the Father. We can read again of this in Yochanan, John chapter 5 and verse 36. Yeshua said he'd come to do all the Father had sent him to do. And he was sounding it out. And we now are to be priests that are carrying the sound of the word of God out to the world also. Again, we see all the colors represented in what has been worn. I'm going to draw your attention to the ephod. So we'll go to a picture that shows that close up. I forgot to show you my next one. This gives you just, you know, another version to give you some other ideas. Since we went through it before, I'll go ahead and go past it quickly. And we'll go down to our uh, ephod. The ephod was on the breast. Uh, this had all the colors again, spoke for all that they represent. There are two pieces to this. It was joined at the shoulders. You can barely see that in this picture, but it's there at the top. Uh, two onyx stones held that together and engraved in those two stones were the names of the 12 tribes. And it was a picture of the, the governing over the 12.